why Arcanaut is such a good home for me is that they're just a bunch of idiots. All of them. Without exception. Especially Anders. Welcome to the Badger Den. Come on in. So, we are here in Gothenburg, Sweden. Uh, just outside of it, actually, in a town called Partilla. And this is where we have our, my research design development facility facility and it's everything from all the materials we're experimenting with for the watches to my own work that i do with my own company black badger previously before i started with arcanaut it was mostly what black badger was working on was rings um a lot of really unconventional jewelry design with titanium and carbon fiber and that's actually how i got into the photoluminescent materials I got into making jewelry design when I was in design school in Canada um, just because I, we just had so much extra time and I cannot, embarrassed to say, I cannot sketch to save my life. It is an absolute weakness. So I would always be spending more time in the workshop actually making stuff, especially model building, as compared to just sitting and sketching endlessly. So I guess as a byproduct of that, I got to be pretty good at it. Uh, and I would start off making rings years and years ago. I mean. God, almost 20 years ago now. And I would just make fun little things for my my brother for Christmas or for friends and that kind of stuff. And it kind of became bigger and bigger. And uh, I had no intention of getting into it. I didn't study actual jewelry design like some of my friends do. You know, I, I have no abilities with gold or diamonds or stone setting or any of that proper traditional stuff. It, it's, it's the Fordite. It's advanced alloys, carbon fiber, 70,000 year old woolly mammoth tooth. And I don't know if there's any advantage to using materials like that. It's just interesting and fun. And I think having that secondary level of appeal is really important. Having it be, you buy the item because you like it. And then later on, when you explain to a friend of yours what it's made of, and you know, you just blow their hair back. That's kind of a lot of the, the emphasis that I'm putting in my work is this kind of unconventional materials and the, the stories that materials have. The majority of actually manufacturing the different things that I'm responsible for here happens inside this little room here. Now it's an absolute disaster in here, but that's kind of the way it's supposed to be. Um, because the, the, the breadth of different materials and different projects that are happening here, uh, thanks to Arcanaut, is, is just staggering. So it's everything from, this traditionally would have been what I would be using for the rings. So this is for milling steel, titanium, all the weird exotics, magnesium, Damascus and such. The smaller one I would use traditionally more for polishing and for actually milling uh, the Fordite. Because if you do it on the bigger machine, it'll just explode and go flying all over the place. Now, the majority of what I'm doing is more on this end of the room. Sawing, sanding, uh, the, I would say the most important piece in here is the dust extraction. Uh, and obviously when you're in here working, you've got the mask on and all these kinds of things. So it actually gets to be fairly unpleasant having a big respirator on all day. When I was a little kid, I loved building forts. I would always be pulling the cushions off the couch and building little... Uh, little secret forts and stuff and as soon as i put the walls around this place i just i would just giggle in here because it just didn't it's no different than if i was uh seven years old having a little corner of the house or the kitchen where i would build with my legos or my gi joes or whatever that kind of stuff i think also actually having a physical separation between the design side of my brain and the swearing and throwing tools side of my brain which is about a 70-30 split. I think the fact that I can walk out of this room, leave the dirty apron and leave the chunks of material, come out here and then have ergonomics discussions or, you know, developments discussions and stuff. I think if you're having those in here, it would be a mess. And I think just be able to physically separate yourself from the workshop side of things, I think is, is probably more important than you would realize. The first ring that I ever made would have been about about the year 2000. And it was just a, a really basic little titanium ring. And it started out of this discussion with some friends of mine that in Canada, when you graduate engineering school, all the graduates get a really simple iron ring. 
Originally, it was a ring that was a piece of a bridge that collapsed, I think, in Quebec because of faulty engineering. So in a very sort of self-punishing way, the engineers all wear a ring made out of this to remind themselves the math matters, you know, sort of get things right. So I was having a conversation with some design school friends. What would be the design student version of the, the engineer's iron ring? So I just kind of made the first couple little goofy rings for fun out of that. And then suddenly I was making several a day for myself. So I looked a bit like a Rick James kind of thing with all these rings on. But that really opened up unconventional materials to me. Because I wasn't messing around with rubies or emeralds or anything. It was industrial materials. And that actually came from my interest in cycling. Uh, or so when I was younger. At the time that I was really into it, it was carbon fiber and titanium and all these kind of NASA materials. And I think translating that into jewelry design was where I really started to kind of find an interest. In particular, when I started messing around a lot with the glow in the dark materials. This, I think, caught the interest of the watch industry because you were actually taking the loom, which was traditionally just painted on the hands as an afterthought, and actually really giving it aesthetically center stage. And especially when you start moving the loom away from the dial and you start saying, well, can it be on the strap, on the buckle, on the crown, on the case itself? And I kind of really started specializing in working with light as a design tool. Okay, so now we're gonna go take a look in the loom room. The loom room is where I probably spend a healthy portion of the time doing the actual developmental research on the different photoluminescent materials we're gonna incorporate. A lot of the photoluminescent materials we're working with. Um, you can work in a dark environment and actually even have a controlled UV environment also. This system is a pneumatic powered uh, system for, for actually adding superluminova, liquid superluminova, uh, into rings, into dials and that kind of stuff. Mostly what I use this for actually is the opposite. Is if you need to do some very, very detailed blowing out of some things, um, whether it's trying to get some dust out of a small void in the Fordite or even get some debris out of some of the tiny little minute track holes on the Arcanaut pieces. What I use this for most of the time is actually doing material observation. So with something like the dark matter material, which you've just had another re-release on, a lot of times because it is quite a dynamic material, you need to, essentially every single one, you need to be inspecting and you need to make sure that there's not air bubbles, inclusions, an errant eyelash that would have fallen into the mixture at some point. The problem is as soon as you start looking through a microscope at things, you'll only ever find faults with it. So skip this and save the gray hairs. <laughs> Uh, it was about 2013, and I was actually at Salon QP in London. I hadn't worked on any watches at all, and to be honest, I mostly went over to the show because it was it was free drinks, and I thought that'd be great fun, have a bunch of free cocktails and talk about watches. And I ended up speaking to a hell of a designer, a guy named Giles Ellis in England, a Schofield watch company. And we ended up starting this conversation. We started discussing the luminescent materials. So I had done my first couple of rings that had this weird glow-in-the-dark material in it. And what we wanted to do with this was actually, instead of just having the loom on the hands, we actually went the totally opposite direction and had the perimeter light come in from the outside. And actually the way that I convinced Giles this would work was uh, I took a couple of sunflower seeds and I drew a circle on my hand and I put the sunflower seeds on there and then put a little loom circle I had made. And you could actually tell the, tell the time really quite easily. Um, because when the light's coming in from the outside, it just hits the points of those hands. So it's a much more subtle light than having some, you know, really elaborate G-Shock LEDs or this kind of thing. So that's definitely the one that started it, the Schofield Black Lamp. Quite soon after that, I actually became the one that I couldn't stop talking about if I tried. And this is my collaboration with MBNF. And those those who don't know, this is Maximilian Booster and friends. Uh, the absolute torchbearers of avant-garde watchmaking and one of the most respected brands on the planet. Uh, I met them actually at, at Salon QP and we just chatted for a little while. 
And then about a week later, I was home and Max calls me and invites me on board for this project. I got to say, it's the equivalent of like, you're, you're skating around in your backyard and somebody walks over and offers you an NHL contract. Like it just came out of nowhere. Um, and as soon as you have a brand like MBNF in your repertoire, you're kind of instantly on the map. Um, so things really started happening quickly after that. And it became obvious quite soon thereafter that I needed to actually step back from rings and really kind of dive in whole hog into the watch, into the watch scene. One of the subsequent major projects after that was with David Toon. David Toon is also of the same sort of family as MBNF. Unbelievably high-end uh, independent watchmaking. This was the first time this brand had used luminescent materials in their watch. And what they didn't really like was at the time, a lot of the glow in the dark materials during the day didn't look very nice. Uh, they had a fantastic in the dark performance, but in the daytime, they just looked a little undesirable. They looked a bit like old soap. So what we wanted to do with David Toon was actually create a whole new family of photoluminescent materials that actually looked as good in the daylight as the nighttime. So this was a very fun project because I actually went and spent several days working with Superluminova in Switzerland. And we actually got to have this really exciting, exciting design brief where it was, we wanted to glow a certain color. And we also wanted to have a certain daytime appearance because David Toon was really known for this high polished oxidized titanium, a uh, really nice bluing, as you would say. So actually matching that color in the daytime, but then actually having the emitted light not be just the regular blue that everybody else uses on their watch. So we actually managed to create uh, two independent colors, one emitted violet light, one emitted ultramarine light, and then actually find the right ratio to mix those together, then change the daytime color. So we actually ended up creating a material that had never been used before. Um, according to Superluminova, this was the first time in the history of the watch industry anybody had done this. It's such a cool thing to kind of have a little bit of ownership over doing that really weird research side of things and not just picking a really sexy color out of a catalog that already exists. This project led to this project, led to this project, led to you know, us standing here several years later. And there's still a bunch of weird experimental research things going on. What we have going on here is the uh, super high-tech advanced materials research development facility. Um, which consists mostly of powder and glue. Um, this is actually quite fun because we don't really do anything normal at Arcanaut. We try and be as piratey as humanly possible. So traditionally, when it comes to something like making a watch dial, it's quite a fine, precise, clean process. You don't usually have a giant fucking bag of copper oxide or all these kinds of weird materials kicking around, but that's kind of how we roll. So there was an entire development process that went into one of the pieces um, that was about as close to science as I've managed to come since high school. But this is all materials development, still kind of in the same mentality of what was going on in there. But this is more what would come first. So this is figuring out what the holy hell we can make something out of. Then in there is figuring out how I can destroy it just enough that it works on a watch dial. And man, those things don't often go to plan. I think because I'm officially part of Arcanon now, what I'm really able to step away from was an issue that had really kind of bothered me with many other projects, which is this kind of permanent guest star status. Um, it's very fun. It's very liberating. But at the same time, I am, I'm a guest in your house for dinner, so to speak. So I need to make whatever I'm going to propose, whatever I'm going to develop, at the end of the day, a, a Rolex needs to look like a Rolex. Um, and you don't want to be, you don't want to be flippant. You don't want to be abusive with somebody else's brand, especially some of these brands that had a longer history behind them. With Arcanaut, um, because I was part of the process from the ground level, uh, I was really able to actually implement some of these ideas and aesthetics and then design outwards from that. So instead of taking an existing watch and saying, Okay, here's a beautiful watch. Let's make a Black Badger edition by gluing a bunch of funny stuff on the outside. Like it would just look like a train. We're taking very 
strange looking, very advanced, very visually busy materials. But when you're able to use the aesthetic and the material as part of the ground level and then develop outwards from that, everything just gels so much better. And it has a more balanced, uh, homogenous kind of feel to it. So here, this is one of our great anecdotes from Arcanaut. This is the early stages of the dark matter material that we're making a lot of our watch dials out of. It's, uh, it's slate stone, but it's actually slate stone that breaks off of the fountain in front of the building where I live. So I would sort of go out and just find these little random bits of it um, that have already broken off and grind them up in the, this is only a prototype, the award-winning Arcanaut machine of science, definitely not an industrial espresso grinder. And we would grind up these bits of material and that's what we would make the dark matter material out of. And just the other day, I was going around picking up some small bits to start making the new dials. And one of the neighbor kids walks by and is like, what are you doing? And I'm like, oh, I'm just picking up the broken pieces of rock off the ground here to make some watch parts out of. And the little kid goes over to the edge of the fountain and just kind of goes and lifts up this big, here, here you go. So if there's any cops watching, I'm not actually vandalizing things. I'm picking up stuff off the ground. It was a seven-year-old kid that actually broke that off the fountain. That's what I, don't blame, hey, look, are you a cop? Okay. So, and then over here, obviously it's the more sort of, uh, the, the more sort of finished area of things. I mean, a bit of a throwback to earlier projects, but this is all the, all the rings and all these things that I worked on for years and was really quite a large part of my business. Um, and I, I, I still wear these all the time, to be honest. But uh, every time people come to visit, I always have to check their pockets because things tend to go missing sometimes. The way I actually came with the name Black Badger for the company was uh, a gazillion years ago when I first started making stuff. Uh, a lot of what I was making was like carbon fiber parts for like paintball guns and this sort of stuff. I was way too into it years ago. And I wanted a, a logo and a name that kind of had this kind of like World War II paratrooper squadron, you know, kind of vibe to it. And as you can tell, I don't take myself super seriously. Um, so I it, it just sort of came to me, honestly, in the middle of Swedish grammar class when I, when I should have been doing my homework, which I clearly hadn't. Otherwise, I'd be doing this in Swedish right now. And uh, to be honest, it, when I first started with the rings, it was an easy transition because the name was a little silly and it had this kind of almost like a skull and crossbones kind of logo and it was fine. And now, the fact that you can pick up an MBNF watch and it's got my goofy Black Badger logo on the back of it has to be one of the greatest orological coups of all time because it's, it's the dumbest logo ever. But I think it does speak to a certain level of piratiness. So because a lot of the materials that I'm working with are there's a lot of advanced composites and this kind of stuff, you do tend to get a lot of associations with motorsports. Um, I'm huge into F1. I actually got this as a Christmas present for my kids last year. And I kid you not, it took me about a year to put the thing together. It is, I'm actually more proud of that than almost anything else in the room here. But on an interesting side note, that's last year's McLaren F1 livery. Um, I actually got this from a friend last year and uh, Lando Norris actually has a couple of my rings of these sort of golf racing themed rings. So I managed to get that signed by him. So that's pretty, I'm pretty darn proud of that. This is, I was at the McLaren factory a couple years ago and I was meeting with this guy, Frank Stephenson, who was their design chief, a really famous car designer and a generally awesome guy. And the, the McLaren F1 design team was actually working on a, what is F1 gonna look like in 2050 type of thing. So he actually had, had his team knock up a rendering that's got my logos on the car and it's got me as the driver, which is really ironic because I don't have a driver's license and I'm not really into cars at all, but it's the contrast that I love. What's quite fun about this place is my friend that has the business next door does large scale vinyl decal printing, like does the wraps for like hockey team buses and all this type of stuff. So a lot of the imagery in here, here he's done for me. This up here, the mighty Lancia Stratos, 
um, was an artist, Mark Dawson, that I found on Instagram. And instead of just buying a small print, I asked if I could actually buy the digital file and had a friend next door just do this massive, massive decal of it. And through a really cool series of events, uh, Arcanaut actually sponsors a professional rally driver in Portugal, a guy named Bernardo Souza. It's just awesome. And for his Arcanaut, we actually did a custom engraved, custom laser engraved case back. And we had Mark actually do a custom art piece of one of Bernardo's images of him driving and actually had that engraved in the back of his, in the back of his watch from that idea. It's a pretty cool job sometimes. I can't lie. <laughs> you know what? It's just, it's having fun with what you're doing. And I think there's enough people in our industry that take themselves a little more seriously than they should. And I think the reason why, why Arcanaut is such a good home for me is that they're just a bunch of idiots. All of them, without exception. Especially Anders. Um, <laughs> well, that's going to do it for me. That's been the Badger Dan in here. Uh, thanks for taking a look. And uh, now you got to leave because I got work to do. Go. Bye. So my friend Johan wrote a book and it's this kind of dark, uh, you know, Lovecraft with a lot of religious tones to it. And he actually wrote Black Badger as a character in the book. <laughs> so like the guy in the story finds this weird uh, religious item at the bottom of a lake and he has to take it to somebody to explain it and figure out what it is. And that character is, oh, I'll, go, I'll take it to my friend Black Badger. He'll know what it is. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'd read it too, but it's in Swedish, so good luck with that.